The management of a patient with ischemic stroke has turned upside down in the last four years. We're closing PFOs, using TPA and wake-up strokes, we're advancing to newer fibrinolytics, stronger antiplatelet agents, and combinations of antiplatelet agents, and now we have thrombectomy. The mechanical retrieval of thrombus lodged within an intracranial vessel. And we've shown that in patients who present early enough, and they have no major evidence of ischemic injury, that this can be done safely and effectively. For some patients, it's more effective at deterring long-term disability than cardiac catheterization for heart attack. But we're not going to talk about that today. Today, we're talking about the fine print of endovascular clot retrieval. We'll thread our way through the who, the when, and the how of mechanical thrombectomy. And just before we wrap up, what needs to be done afterwards? What is the optimal management strategy in a patient who undergoes thrombectomy, or who fails it? I got an email a few months back from Dr. Gauhar Malik, a stroke doc from Bristol, UK, who was particularly interested in this last question. And to give you the best answer, I'll be speaking with one of the world's experts in thrombectomy on today's program. I have been involved in acute stroke interventions ever since I moved to Pittsburgh 19 years ago. Tudor Joven. Welcome back to another week of the Brainways Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Siegler. And I'm Jesse Tone. And on our program today, endovascular thrombectomy for acute large vessel occlusion. The trials, the treatment, and the trouble we're left with as we navigate through some of the murky aspects of medical management. Stay with us. Hi, Brainwaves listeners. My name is Ray Price. I'm the director of the Neurology Residency Program at the University of Pennsylvania, and I also direct the Penn Neurology Board Review course, now in its 16th year. For those of you preparing for the initial or recertification examinations, you know this can be a stressful time, but it doesn't have to be. Our high-yield course is more than 50 hours of recorded lectures for you to review for up to six months before the boards, and two days of live or online case-based learning. Past participants have found this an excellent way to prepare with well-organized high-yield material and engaging lectures. And for those of you who prefer problem-based learning, we have over a thousand board-style questions available to people who take the course. For Brainwaves listeners, we offer a $150 discount on registration fees if you enter the promo code WAVES2019. Just check out the website link in this week's show notes or Google 16th Pen Neurology Board Review. Again, the promo code is WAVES2019. That's WAVES in all caps, 2019. Hey, Tudor. Hey. Hello. All right, everything's great. For this week's installment of the podcast, my co-fellow Jesse Tone joined us for the conversation about thrombectomy and acute stroke. My name is Jesse Tone. I'm a neurovascular fellow at Hospital University of Pennsylvania. And you already heard a little bit from Tudor Joven, who joined us via Skype. Hi, this is uh, Tudor Joven. I'm a vascular and interventional neurologist. Who now works at Cooper University Hospital in Camden, New Jersey, which happens to be where Jesse and I'll be working starting in July. Uh, recently moved from University of Pittsburgh, where he directed the Stroke and Endovascular Center for 19 years, as you heard. Um, I was lucky to uh, participate as principal investigator, co-principal investigator in, in several landmark trials. Uh, Ravascat, Dawn, maybe you heard of them. And then Dr. Joven also acted as an integral co-investigator for other randomized clinical trials like IMS3, which was stopped early due to futility because it failed to show benefit of endovascular thrombectomy plus TPA over TPA alone. Uh, which was obviously a big disappointment. Um, a disappointment for several reasons we'll get into in a minute. Actually, 2013 was the year we started Revascat. One of the half dozen RCTs published in 2015, 2016, which would later demonstrate an overwhelming benefit of thrombectomy for an acute stroke in the early window. That was a crazy stroke conference year for sure. But then he teamed up with Raul Nogueira to lead an even more game-changing trial. Dawn, uh, which Dawn, the first and the only randomized clinical trial to show benefit of endovascular thrombectomy in acute stroke for up to 24 hours after the patient was last known well. And we're going to talk about all those advancements in today's show. Right, I understand. So you can cut whatever you you, you can still edit the podcast. Yeah. After. Okay. We're we're going to talk about all that stuff into in a little more detail. Dr. Joven, thank you so much for joining us today. Going back to 2015, before that, we didn't really use thrombectomy uh, widely for acute stroke management. Can you talk a little bit about what changed around that time? 
Well, in general, thrombectomy was not being used widely, but there were a handful of centers, such as the center was I, where I was practicing at that time, UPMC, where we were uh, using it quite heavily. And I would say that the biggest advance in the field has been the technological advance. And that probably explains why. It was mostly the development of more advanced neurointerventional tools, Dr. Jovan says. But it was also the patients who were selected, and later on, advanced neuroimaging. In IMS-3, the clinical trial that showed no benefit of thrombectomy, the majority of patients were treated using intraarterial TPA, or mechanical revascularization using the penumbra aspiration system, or Mercy Retriever. Thrombectomy with the first generation uh, mechanical thrombectomy devices. Which was kind of like a corkscrew for clots. 98% of patients were treated in this way. Stent retriever technology, which we now know to be more effective, emerged during the middle of the IMS-3 trial, and only 2% of patients were recanalized using the solitaire stent retriever. Then there was also the selection of appropriate candidates. So I think the fact that uh, by design, IMS-3 did not exclude patients without large vessel occlusion and uh, only selected patients based on a, an NIH stroke scale score uh, was... Only severe strokes were included, NIH stroke scale scores of 10 or more. But only about two-thirds of patients had large vessel occlusions. And clearly, patients without large vessel occlusions aren't going to benefit from a procedure that is designed to take out the occlusion. There's nothing to revascularize. And then Dr. Joven commented on the importance of imaging selection. I mean, initially, I thought that there were more important factors at play, such as uh, imaging, that we didn't select patients uh, well enough. Because in IMS-3, patients could have any degree of infarction and nearly half of them had an aspect score of seven or less, indicating that potentially more than a third of the MCA territory had sustained irreversible injury. But it turns out, based on subsequent data, in the early time window, probably imaging doesn't, is not a big differentiator in terms of of who benefits. It is is a prognostic factor in that good imaging... Imaging was a prognostic factor, not a requirement for benefit. At least in the early window, meaning within six hours. According to the Hermes Collaboration, the meta-analysis supergroup of stroke trialists, which included Dr. Joven, who've combined all the patient-level data from the 2015 and the 2016 thrombectomy trials, patients who underwent thrombectomy seemed to benefit from the intervention regardless of whether they had a poor aspects or if they had significant established infarct on the unenhanced CT scan. Granted, the risk of symptomatic hemorrhage was higher, and the probability of achieving functional independence was not as great as the patients with better-looking baseline CTs. But compared to no intervention, thrombectomized patients still did better. And then we're we're, uh, down to workflow, which is another uh, important factor uh, back then. Workflow, meaning getting uh, patients efficiently from the ER to the scanner to the angio suite to recanalization. Time is still tissue, and in patients with larger strokes and proximal occlusions, time loss carries a lot more weight when it comes to a patient's functional outcome. uh, Even though workflow is probably a significant component, At the end, I think that the biggest difference is in the rate of reperfusion. Reperfusion, as in how much blood flow to the brain was restored, which we measure using the TIKI score. A score of 2B or 3 means that more than half or all the blood flow is restored, while anything less than 2B is not considered a successful reperfusion. Because those patients tend to have a worse clinical outcome than those with thinking 2B or 3 recanalization. The uh, reason uh, most responsible for the difference in results of these two generations of trials has been technology. Kind of along with that, before 2018, we were taught that time is tissue. And Jeff Saver's mouse model gave us a statistic we use all the time in stroke, that we lose about 2 million neurons per minute with acute stroke. Essentially, time is brain. Is that still the case, or are there some other factors involved when uh, determining if someone might be eligible for an acute treatment like thrombectomy? Yeah, it's totally the, still the case. Jesse asked this question because we continue to extend the window for reperfusion, now up to 24 hours. So it begs the question, does time matter? And it would be a mistake to assume that it doesn't. But like Dr. Joven said during the interview, the 2 million neuron loss per minute model is a model that's not without fault. That that rate of of neuronal loss of 2 million per minute uh, represents an average of all comers. 
So some mice lost cells at a rate of 1 million, some at 5 million. This 2 million neurons per minute truly represents an average of a heterogeneous population uh, with respect to the rate of neuronal loss. In that there are what we call fast progressors and the determining factor of of infarct growth is presence of collaterals. And in these super fast progressors, the rate of neuronal loss can be as high as 24 million neurons per minute. Not 2 million, 24 million. And if there are fast progressors, there have to be slow progressors, right? Uh, which, by the way, are the dawn and diffuse three patients. These were the patients selected for the dawn and diffuse trials using neuroimaging. And there, the rate of neuronal loss is much slower. Nowhere near 2 million neurons per minute as low as 15,000 neurons per minute. So uh, it is fundamentally important to recognize that, that this rate of neuronal loss is not the same in every individual. And again, as Dr. Joven said, it has everything to do with collateral vessel status. So we've got this growing pool of data showing the benefit of thrombectomy, especially in the early window that if you come in within six hours of a proximal large vessel occlusion, a clot in the ICA terminus or M1 or even M2, that taking the clot out using a stent retriever or one of the next generation aspiration devices like ADAPT or Salumbra, you can dramatically increase the chances of a good outcome in these patients. Is there anyone who doesn't benefit? So in this time window, um, we really have not found any factor that tells us that a patient does not benefit from endovascular therapy other than patient doesn't have an occlusion or, or you know obvious things like that but we used to think not older patients large, not patients with large infarcts on head ct patients with large cores on ct perfusion not patients with bad collaterals or large clot burdens nobody uh, there's still significant benefit in favor of thrombectomy. And this data is supported also by CT perfusion, also published in Lancet Neurology. And uh, it turns out that even when you measure the infarct precisely uh, and you deal with large infarcts, the trends are clearly in favor of, of benefit. There is no basis now to exclude patients from treatment just because of imaging. Now again, imaging is a prognostic factor, but is not a treatment effect modifier. Age, exactly the same story. A prognostic treat, factor, uh, not treatment effect modifier. That's not to say that we should treat every patient who is old, but age in itself should not be the differentiating factor. And it's important here to recognize that age correlates with clinical disability, functional impairment, dementia, and dependence on others. In those cases where a patient already requires significant help with daily activities, it's not clear that there is much to gain with thrombectomy. But it's the functional disability, not age, that's likely to lead to a limited benefit with thrombectomy. It's the same story at the uh, severe end of the spectrum. A prognostic factor, but not treatment effect modifier, especially patients with the very severe strokes tend to benefit with thrombectomy compared to no thrombectomy. Where things are unclear is uh, in the mild uh, stroke category. I think that's not clear in my mind whether these patients benefit or not. I think we need more answers from randomized trials. Trials in, in patients with low NIH stroke scale scores less than six and these trials are... I'll jump in here and say, although these are technically mild strokes, that does not mean these patients are immune from long-term disability. A patient can have a severe aphasia and lose the ability to communicate, despite having a stroke scale of 6. Or they could have severe dysphagia and never be able to swallow safely again. So this is one question that remains unanswered by available randomized trials. So let's move on to the trials that enrolled patients in the extended window. 6 to 16 hours from last known normal for diffuse 3, and 6 to 24 hours for dawn. The inclusion criteria were a bit more stringent in these extended window thrombectomy trials, if only because we were worried that these patients were less likely to do well with the intervention. And unlike most of those early window trials, Dawn and Diffuse 3 relied on perfusion imaging, either CT perfusion or MR perfusion. For neurologists who aren't used to using these imaging modalities, could you very briefly uh, walk us through the basics of perfusion imaging for acute stroke? Uh, basically, the perfusion imaging for acute stroke is a 
test where you give a uh, an imaging study where you give a bolus of a certain contrast agent. In the case of uh, CT perfusion, it's uh, X-ray dye. In the case of uh, MRI, it's gadolinium. And, and, and the CT perfusion will then outline uh, the extent of tissue hypoperfusion uh, or, or uh, like Dr. Joven says, perfusion imaging relies on a radio tracer that's injected peripherally and quantitated as the brain CT images are acquired. Using the tracer, either iodinated contrast for CT or gadolinium for MRI, we can measure the volume of blood throughout the brain. Uh, if you don't have any blood flow in the brain, the volume is going to be low. Uh, in fact, then you have the mean transit time, uh, which is how long it takes the dye to get through the tissue and the time to tissue maximum residue function. Uh, Tmax. There are a few other parameters that we can glean from this imaging output, but those are the ones really worth knowing, and those are the ones that tell us the most about tissue viability. Based upon which uh, you consider the tissue either dead or imminently threatened or hypoperfused but not imminently threatened or normally perfused. What has been referred to as infarcor is what we see in the CBF map. What we call the ischemic core. Which again is a time-dependent study of critical hypoperfusion. How much dead brain is there? Thresholds of CBF less than 30% and less than 20% have been used in the literature to correlate with eventual infarction, even if recanalization is achieved. However, I cannot stress enough that this is not a guarantee. And Dr. Joven agrees. I am skeptical, especially in the in the ultra early time window, that we're going to be able to figure out uh, what is dead and what is what is alive based on perfusion studies alone. For example, a CBF volume of 50 milliliters of brain tissue does not absolutely mean 50 milliliters of brain will absolutely infarct, regardless of what you do. Some of this tissue may still be salvageable. In either case, we use this standard infarct core estimate using CBF. Then we compare this to the hypoperfusion volume, where there is a delayed blood flow. This may be best estimated using the mean transit time, or the Tmax. Because prolonged mean transit time, or Tmax, indicate a delay in the transit of contrast. These may also correlate with eventual infarction. But some thresholds, traditionally a 6 second or more delay in the Tmax, have been used to correlate with oligemia, and not necessarily infarction. The difference in volume estimates between the Tmax region of interest and the CBF are increasingly being used to quantitate the volume of salvageable tissue with intervention. For the sake of time, we're oversimplifying this, but if you'd like to learn more, please take a look at some of the references in the show notes. As I mentioned, right now in the early time window, we uh, have no evidence that even in patients with large amount of dead brain, meaning in aspects of less than six, or high CBF volumes on perfusion CT. That there is no benefit from thrombectomy. I do not think that it's going to be relevant uh, what the infarct size is. We're just going to go in and, and, and reperfuse the brain. Large core, bad aspects, but last known well within six hours if somebody has a good functional status, then go for it. In the late time window, it's a bit of a different story. We have less information. By late time window, he means 6 to 24 hours after last known normal. Right now, the Dawn and Diffuse 3 paradigms have tested the hypothesis of benefit in the late time window in patients with small or moderate infarcts. Meaning aspects of 6 or more in CBF volumes of generally less than 50 to 70 cc's. And evidence of large territories at risk. With Tmax region substantially exceeding the CBF region for the Diffuse 3 trial, or for Dawn, there had to be a clinical imaging mismatch, so symptom severity exceeding the CBF region. Again, like Jesse said, we are oversimplifying things here, and all this is based on trial data. The real-world clinical applications are very different. Dr. Joven stresses these limitations here. Right now, we don't have great tools that tell us what is dead and what is not dead, and very importantly, critically important, Whatever tools we have take too much time. And the time that we take to obtain this information is not worth the information itself. And it's a legitimate question to ask whether doing advanced imaging harms patients because of delayed reperfusion.
Next, we moved on to the technical aspects of thrombectomy. Yeah, so so more of a kind of a procedural aspect. Uh, during the thrombectomy procedure itself, which method of sedation do you prefer and why? Well, I definitely prefer no intubation, no general anesthesia. No question about that. Not only to save time, to save brain. For some reason, and again, this is controversial to some extent, uh, these randomized trials uh, have shown that patients who are treated under general anesthesia, even when you control for their stroke severity, do much worse than patients who are done awake. Now, these studies were not uh, confirmed by randomized trials, but the randomized trials were done in different patient populations at select centers who were not attuned to doing these cases awake to begin with, and in a handful of patients. So my personal... Dr. Jovan kind of said a lot there. First, subgroup analyses of thrombectomy trials showed general anesthesia was bad for patients. And second, the randomized trial data for general anesthesia versus conscious sedation showed no difference, but this was limited. So let's break it down. Siesta was one of the earliest RCTs, including 150 patients at a single center with large vessel occlusion and high NIH stroke scale. And the investigators showed that general anesthesia was associated with a doubled rate of functional independence at three months. But overall, the rate of a good outcome was low. Only 18% of patients achieved functional independence at three months with conscious sedation. Also, the time from groin puncture to recanalization was longer for the conscious sedation group, which likely contributed to the differences in outcome. Then we had the Goliath results. 128 patients, also like Siesta, recruited from a single center with anterior large vessel occlusion and high stroke scales. It showed no benefit of general anesthesia over conscious sedation. Reperfusion was more successful with general anesthesia than conscious sedation, and the volume of infarct growth was less in the GA arm. So maybe the general anesthesia group should have done better. And then we have Mr. Clean and the diffused three subgroups. Conscious sedation was associated with a 50 to 70% higher probability of long-term functional independence. These patients weren't randomized to conscious sedation or general anesthesia. And patients who underwent conscious sedation had milder strokes to begin with for diffuse 3 or less premorbid disability for Mr. Clean. And as Dr. Joven mentioned, the Hermes meta-analysis on sedation, which was published in 2018, showed that conscious sedation was associated with a 53% higher probability of a more favorable shift in the 90-day modified Rankin score when it was compared to general anesthesia. But now there's uh, increasing data coming out suggesting that even conscious sedation is not a good thing and that the best method of sedation is no sedation. So in my own practice, I advocate for start out with no sedation. If the patient is very agitated or, or something, then intravenous sedation uh, in a wake state. My next question for you has to deal with the medical management. After a patient undergoes thrombectomy, whether it's successful or not, what should providers do next? Uh, specifically related to thrombectomy, the big question is always blood pressure. How do you manage blood pressure? I'm not sure exactly what the the impact on blood pressure management is on the overall outcome. It could be a significant impact. It could not be a significant impact. We don't know. There's no good data, uh, randomized or, or otherwise, that guide us on how to uh, manage these patients. Uh, obviously, we're always concerned about uh, reperfusion injury, and because of that, we tend to lower the blood pressure when the patient is reperfused. That's what I do. Whether it's the right thing to do or not, I'm not sure. But in patients who have recanalized completely or reperfused completely, the ticky threes, I'm very aggressive with lowering blood pressure to the 120, 140 range with intravenous agents in the ones who are partially recanalized, in general, maybe a bit less aggressive with, with blood pressure control. And the ones who don't So that doesn't sound unreasonable, that, but what do you think, Jesse? That, that, that's I think it's okay. The vessel is now not occluded. You're not worried about promoting collateral growth or perfusing area that doesn't have adequate blood flow. And reperfusion injury becomes more of a concern with higher blood pressures. 
But then there's also this argument of impaired cerebral autoregulation, like how much of that is probably just based on cellular and animal data, not really based in human physiology. Well, I think that's a really good point, Jim. You know, in patients that have maybe TICI 2B, TICI 2A, or even TICI 1, you might be more concerned about the residual occlusion and wanting to promote blood flow in the setting of occlusion. But in patients where you get full recanalization, I think what Dr. Jovin is saying is if there's still some occlusion, you like might want to be more careful. And if there isn't, then it's probably okay to drop the blood pressure. But really, if the patient is autoregulating, it's probably for a reason and you should let them autoregulate. What about other things like like aspirin? and yeah? I, I, I do use aspirin post-procedure, except for patients who have received intravenous TPA. And that's because of standardized protocols. Uh, for the ones who are on anticoagulants, especially with uh, Coumadin with high INRs and things like that, I tend to reverse their anticoagulation. In patients on NOAX, I just stop it. Glucose. Uh, we have then, as Dr. Joven goes on to tell us, of course we aim for your typical post-stroke goals. Euthermia, euglycemia, treat infections. The, the general sort of uh, supportive care. We monitor closely for neurological deterioration. And where Jim and I work, the protocol is much like the post-TPA protocol regarding neurochecks and vital signs. One thing we also do is repeat a head CT immediately post-thrombectomy. Jim, what do you think about that? I think it's interesting. And I think that if you wake up from thrombectomy, if you're extubated, if you had general anesthesia, and your exam is much improved, I think the probability of having hemorrhagic transformation with TPA or with thrombectomy is extraordinarily low. And we don't image patients immediately after TPA is given, we wait 24 hours. So I think in the absence of a clinical deterioration, a small amount of petechial blood has very little clinical consequence for the management of these patients. Does that sound fair? Very fair. So I think I, I know I know the answer to this question, but would you recommend that neurologists and stroke neurologists stick strictly to the trial criteria when considering patients for a thrombectomy? Well, that's a tough question. I don't blame the ones who adhere strictly to uh, guidelines. I mean, you know, that's where you're grounded on the most solid uh, evidence. The view that I take is that with all these trials, we, we kind of overdid it, if you want. Uh, we focused on the patient population that has the highest possible benefit from these interventions. So when you have numbers needed to treat of three or four for getting somebody from a higher level of uh, disability to a lower level of disability, these are extremely powerful treatments. And what that tells me is that we have left behind a lot of patients that could also benefit. There's also some evidence to support this approach. Weaker evidence, but it's evidence nevertheless. Right. So it appears that patients with certain clinical or radiographic features are more likely to benefit from thrombectomy than others. In one prospective single-center registry of patients with an unknown time of onset, but who otherwise met clinical and imaging criteria for the extended window trials, about 40% of patients achieve functional independence in 90 days. Then we have other data from Thrace, which suggests that patients with large infarcts and MRI, greater than 70 cc's, these patients still have a reasonable chance of functional recovery with thrombectomy. And other retrospective data are being increasingly reported. Importantly, we won't know how bad the aspects has to be, or how large the CBF volume can get, how old the patient is, or how long the symptoms must go on for, before we fail to see a benefit of thrombectomy after that six-hour window. So is there such an occlusion? Is there salvageable brain? And is the patient's condition one that warrants uh, these kind of interventions? And if the answer is yes, then uh, I, I personally offer patients treatment outside of guidelines. That was wonderful. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, Dr. Joven. Great. Thank you. That wraps it up for another episode of Brainwaves. It really is amazing how rapidly our treatment options have expanded for stroke in the last couple of years. Our techniques are growing faster than your board exams can keep up with. 
And speaking of board exams, there's still time to sign up for the Penn Neurology Board Review course. Take a look at the show notes in this week's program for the link to sign up. And for Brainwaves listeners, you can save $150 on registration costs if you use our promo code WAVES2019. That's one word with WAVES in all caps, 2019. The Brainwaves Podcast is produced out of Studio 3 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'd like to thank Dr. Jesse Tone for co-hosting our program this week and Dr. Tudor Joven for joining us via Skype. Music was courtesy of Sukit, Cold Noise, Medin, John Watts, Lee Rosevere, and Mystery Mammal. Sound effects by Mike Koenig and Daniel Simeon. As always, you can follow Brainwaves on Twitter or Facebook at Brainwaves Audio and drop us a line sometime. Let us know what you'd like to hear on the show. I'm Jim Suka for Brainwaves. Thanks for listening.